It's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. So good to be in His presence and just to hear His heart. And very thankful for the Spirit of the Lord in this place and His words to us. Amen. So tonight we are going to consider a verse that I know I've read multiple times. I actually, when I was younger, we going growing up in a Christian school, we we memorized actually this chapter, but this this verse just caught me different this time around. And we're we're coming up on the the resurrection season when. We celebrate the resurrection of Christ and his his death and everything that the price he paid for us. And so lately I've found myself in Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. And we see pretty much a complete picture of the man of sorrows. The man of sorrows. And just the depths that Christ went through for us. And it wasn't just the death on the cross that was a major part of it, but he laid down everything for us. Uh, He made himself of no reputation. He took upon himself the form of a servant. He was afflicted and oppressed, misunderstood, despised, rejected, uh, wounded and bruised and crushed for us. And as you read through this chapter, Isaiah 53, it's, it's a beautiful chapter, but it, it's hard to get through because you understand what Christ paid for us. And the verse that we're going to consider tonight is verse 11 of Isaiah chapter 53, verse 11. It says, He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. He shall see of the travail of his soul. And shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. He shall bear their iniquities. So tonight I just want to consider, uh, it's not going to be a long message by any means, but I just want to consider the travail of our soul, the travail of our soul, and how we can how we can come to know Christ through the fellowship of his sufferings in our lives and how that can be just as Christ had to come to know some of the lowest points in his life were purchasing and doing something for us. And so how we can, in those times when we feel like we're in the, the travail of our soul, how that is purchasing, it's, it's doing something not only for us, but for others as well. And so the night before Christ went to the cross, he went into the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples. Uh, Interesting fact that I learned, and I'm sure I, I have heard it before, but the Garden of Gethsemane was actually located on the Mount of Olives. I didn't really realize that before. But, um, I thought that was interesting just because once again, we talked about the significance of the Mount of Olives, but Gethsemane in, he, in the Hebrew means oil press, oil press. And so the scene that took place in the garden before Christ's captors came and just the travail of, of, of Christ in the garden and, and the depths that were poured out to the Father in prayer that scene can kind of give us a picture of, of what was really going on in the spirit. And it was almost as if the anointed one, Christ, was being pressed out of measure. Everything that he had inside of him, all of his anointing was being pressed. And it was that final encapsulation of a life that was lived to be poured out to us. And we know very well the story he took his disciples and he asked them to watch and pray with them. Watch and pray with him. And I think we can, it's so easy to kind of judge the disciples and, and say that, you know, they, they fell asleep in Christ's greatest moment of need. And yet, sometimes I find myself getting up early trying to 
get into the Word and falling asleep and having to set constant alarms to wake myself up. And so I'm always reminded of the scene. But here we find in Luke chapter 22, Luke chapter 22, verses 44 through 46, it says of Christ that being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow, sleeping for sorrow, and said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. So, once again, it can be easy to kind of look at the disciples and, and think, how, how is it possible that you are falling asleep when Christ was in his greatest moment of support, need of support and, and prayer, and yet it says that they, they were under a lot of pressure being with Christ. Christ was, he was pouring out his soul to them, and there was agony, there was pressure that was coming upon Christ, and because of that, they, they weren't able to handle it in their flesh. And so they had fallen asleep. And so when he came back to his disciples after praying, he found them unable to bear the pressure of the moment. And if we back up to the earlier chapter of Luke chapter 21, Luke chapter 21, and this is somewhat specific, this little passage here to the Gospel of Luke, but the the wording that is used is very, very significant and strong, I believe. But in Luke chapter 21, verses 34 and 35, Luke chapter 21, verses 34 and 35, it says, Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness in the cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. And we're going to look in a second here at the next verse here, but I just want to consider this thought and, and somewhat spiritualize on this for a moment here, because this talks specifically about surfeiting and drunkenness, so pretty much being drunk to excess here. But I want to spiritualize that on that for a moment because we know that naturally when you're drunk, it dulls the senses. And I feel like there's a lot of that going on spiritually right now where the enemy is trying to get the people of God's senses to be dull. He's trying to cause God's people to grow lax, to lose their first love, to forfeit things that, uh, that we've obtained in, in Christ. And so just thinking of my own personal life, it's so easy to get consumed with whether it's social media or entertainment or news or even just even listening to to messages and preachers and, and those types of things can be so easy to get so consumed with that that you're not hearing from God. You're not hearing or listening for his voice. Naturally, uh, the average time spent on social media per day in the United States is something close to two hours and 45 minutes per day. And that's according to multiple sites that I looked at, and sometimes that was on the, the lower end of the scale. And so almost three hours per day, just s- people are spending just just completely wasting time. And as we heard when we were in Jamestown, you know, it's as it, it's those idols that are set up that as you what you worship, what you allow to consume your your thoughts and your mind that's what you become and so i think it's it's just a it was a wake-up call for me in the spirit that lord i want to hear from you i want to be in your word i want to be transformed by those good things and i i think there is there's a definite tool that social media has we have a youtube channel that we we post uh, our our messages out and want to get the word of word of christ out to 
But we just want to be careful with that, that, Lord, are we, are we so plugged into different sources that we're, we're not hearing your voice or we're getting confused? Um, because that's another thing. There's, you know, you can listen to so many things and then be like, oh, which, which thing's right or what thing's true? And unfortunately, the, the upcoming generation is completely, they have no thought process. They're just, whatever they hear, they, they go with and it forms them. And then, you know, later on down the, the, the road, they wonder why they've chosen the, the path they have. And it's because of what they've chosen to, to dwell on. And so, just kind of bringing this back to this thought of being watchful, being watchful and being aware that what we listen to, what we consume, what we feed upon, ultimately can can cause us to either be sharpened in our spiritual senses, or it can cause us to be dull. And there was a, a great prophet who came through Erie at one point, and they mentioned that they seen in the spirit that one of the prevailing princes that reigned over Erie had a dunce cap on. Had a dunce cap on. And uh, the dunce cap was a little bit before my time. I think it was in the 50s that it was kind of used in the classroom as a punishment for those who were kind of the class clowns or they weren't taking things seriously or they were disruptive in the classroom. And... I think in the spirit, that's kind of what's going on in Erie. There's there's so much just sp- spiritual dullness. dullness. That's the word. That's that's it. And I I can attest to that because even even really trying to go on with the Lord, there's like this this fog that you have to fight against. And I was at the gas station the other night, and there was this gentleman out outside of the the door going into the gas station. I could tell there was there was something going on in his life and I just said, Hey man, are you are you okay? And and he just poured out to me that he was in this fog and you know all this stuff was happening and we prayed together and I of course gave him a little bit of money or whatever and um but I felt like in that moment there was maybe just this major oppression that was over him. And that's that's what we're facing in Erie. And as we heard tonight, we want to see the giants come down in our land. And so this is what we need to stand against. But in my history books growing up in a Christian school, they always define revival as when a sleepy church wakes up, when that dullness is, that those clouds are removed. And once again, people begin to see their need for Christ and they come into the church. And so we we looked at kind of this, you know, this spiritual drunkenness, but also the it talks about the cares of life, the cares of life that can weigh us down. And uh it says that the cares of life will the the wording I want to look at here it says lest at any time your hearts be overcharged overcharged and really what that means is bogged down or it makes you basically be carrying a burden that is too heavy to carry and so we want to be careful about the cares of life we can get so caught up in worldliness and possessions and stuff and money and all of that can be a snare to us and a snare is a trap that a hunter sets to to make it difficult to become untangled. They want to trap that animal or whatever it is, and you can't free yourself. You can't get free. And so what is the remedy to this? What is the remedy to this? Verse 36 of Luke chapter 21. So Luke 21, verse 36. It says, Watch ye therefore and pray always, that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And so this is where, this verse here is where we need to focus our energies to, to watch, to be watchful, to not let ourselves grow slack, to really continue to press in. And it says to pray always, to pray always. And... 
I don't know about anyone else here, but I've been I've been praying so much more than I've ever had to pray just to kind of stay afloat, it seems. And that's kind of the mode we're in now is to, to be praying. And, and it's so funny because sometimes you don't quite have enough energy to even formulate thoughts or, or a comprehensive prayer. And so thank God for being able to pray in the Spirit, right? Because... Um, then our the the spirit himself can make intercession through us, and we don't know what we're praying, but it's accomplishing what it needs to. And Paul, I, I kind of am starting to understand a li- just a tiny bit of 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 why Paul really was bringing out everything he brought out in his epistles, and in First Thessalonians five seventeen, he said, "Pray without ceasing." Pray without ceasing, and I feel like I'm in that mode that any second I'm not thinking or talking to someone or just by myself that I'm praying like without even being conscious of it. And that's that's what's going to see us through in this time. And so we're talking kind of about coming back to the travail, the travail that God's people can go through, and. This is where many of us are at spiritually. It's almost as if, if I could say this, it's it's almost as if we have this holy, I want to say angst, but I don't know if that's the right word, but this like holy, I'm trying to think of the, the word that I want here, but this desperation, I guess, to see God come forth, to see his his plans, his purposes, his promises come to pass. And I've been at it a lot le- a lot, um, a lot less time than many of you, and yet we're in this time together of just, Lord, we need to see you move. We need to see you come upon the scene because we can't, we can't continue m- like this for much longer. And so... We know God is faithful. We know that what he has promised he will do. And we don't doubt that one bit, but we need to see a breakthrough. In uh, Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 23. In Romans chapter 8, man, I, I could read that chapter every day and get new truths from it, but... If we start in verse 18, it says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So, Paul kind of knew a little bit of the sufferings, right? He he was shipwrecked and beat and imprisoned and everything under the sun, and yet he was pressing on at the end of his life. Um, so it's saying here that the sufferings of this present time will are not worthy to be compared with the glory. So there is a glory that shall be revealed in us if we continue on. Verse 19, it says, For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth, and another word for creature could be the creation, waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. We sing that song tonight, Let Your Glory Fall. And uh, all creation is longing for your unveiling of power. Release your anointing. Oh God, let this be the hour. And so there is, even creation itself is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of, sons of God. And we're living in that time where we're being formed and fashioned into those sons and daughters of God. Verse 20, it says, For the cre- the creature was made subject to van- vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So even creation depends upon the sons of God being transformed into the glory of Christ. And verse 22, it says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. 
And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. And so, just this beautiful thought here that there is coming a time. There's an anticipation. It's like it's growing inside of us for the manifestation of the sons of God. And really, that's us. That's a calling to us, all of us. The whole church ultimately is called to this. And as we heard tonight, that's what's happening in the depths of our soul. It's what's happening in the depths of our spirit that is allowing Christ to be formed inside of us. And so until pretty much until the millennium when the curse has been lifted and Christ is ruling and reigning with those who have had this work done in them that is when ultimately we'll see this this take place this manifestation of the sons of God and just as an encouragement tonight and we've we heard once again that it's been a, a long work in many of us a long work but just to encourage us again Isaiah chapter 66 verse 8 Isaiah chapter 66 verse 8 it says who hath heard such a thing who hath seen such things shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day or shall a nation be born at once for as soon as, soon as Zion travailed she brought forth her children so there was a natural fulfillment of this in Israel, but I think also there's going to be a spiritual fulfillment that that God is going to bring forth a people that, you know, maybe it's been a long time coming, and yet at the same time that in a day, things are going to change. Things are going to change. And the beautiful thing is that the Lord is able to do a quick work and effective work in us. And I think we're going to see people that come in to to the church. Maybe maybe they've lived under you know the the captivity of the world, and yet the Lord does something in their life, and they will they will pick up on the message. They will come in, and they will hear, and they will long to be a part of a part of what God is doing. And the Lord can do a quick work in their life. And so, just in the natural. Uh, when Eden was a baby, or before she was born, it was an extremely quick labor process. We, um, it was actually very much orchestrated by God because there was sisters and everyone was out of town and, um, and Frank walked in our door just to visit us and actually pick up his dog. He wasn't even there to stay, but Leah's water broke and we were ready to go to the hospital, and it was a very quick thing, and the baby was born within the hour. And thank God that we got to the hospital, because it would have been um, too much for me to handle, I think. Um, so praise the Lord for his goodness there. But there can be, you know, you go for however long you carry the child, and then it's just like it's so quick that the delivery comes. Sometimes it's not so quick. There's Lucy was... A long time in the hospital, so it's not always like that. But I believe in the spirit that God wants to do a, a quick work in us. And we can get so down on ourselves sometimes because we're like, God, I, I don't see the work done yet, and I, I don't want to miss out. And yet God is, he sees our heart, and he, he knows um, that we're longing for him, and he will do the work in us as we com- submit ourselves to him. We also know, and we're bringing this to a wrap here tonight, I told Frank it was going to be a really quick message, but it's not always the case here, but we know also globally, on a global scale, I mean, COVID-19 changed the, the world in a day, and so I think that's how in the spirit it's going to happen, that God's going to flip the switch and the church is going to be the head and not the tail. And so... We believe that things are being lined up to usher in the end of an age. And even as Christ travailed in his body, soul, and spirit before the cross, 
I believe that we're going through a, a bit of a time of that in the church right now to to birth the glory of of Christ in his people. And I believe just to encourage all of us here that as you as you come into personal victory, it can also unlock victory for those around you. So keep pressing in, keep pressing in for your family, keep pressing in for for those you're closest to because as you obtain victory, it can unlock. Just as David, when he defeated Goliath, the whole army, their their outlook changed. They all went after the Philistines after that, when before they were extremely afraid that none of them wanted to even be or be in that situation at all. But the army was, was down, they were dismayed, they were discomforted. But when David won that victory, they they all took off after the enemy. And just coming back to this first chapter, Isaiah 53, the beautiful way that uh, scripture was lined up. So we have Isaiah 53, which highlights the man of sorrows. And then the next chapter, Isaiah chapter 54, talks about the triumph of the church, the triumph, and talks about how the the barren woman is is bringing forth children that's more than the married wife and and to enlarge the place of your tents and um, stretch forth your curtains and and the Lord's going to move and break forth on the left hand and the right hand and Isaiah chapter fifty four verse six through eight Isaiah fifty four verse six through eight it says. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit and a wife of youth. When thou wast refused, saith thy God, for a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. And so, just a word of encouragement to all of us tonight that we've been in a low place. There's no denying that. I mean, we uh, it's been difficult for, for all of us and sickness and health and financially and um, just everything that's been, been going on with God's people. And yet it's kind of this, this place where God has taken us to to show himself strong on our behalf. It's it's when we're at our weakest point that Christ's strength can come through the most. And so I believe, I want to encourage all of us to keep pressing in no matter what. Even if you're in the wilderness, even if you're in the dry time, that's when Christ is doing some of the deepest work, even if you don't see it. And the last verse, finally, my brethren, because I haven't ever gotten on to that. But uh, finally, my brother, in John chapter 16, verse 21. John 16, 21, it says, A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish, for joy that a man is born into the world. And we're looking to see Christ be formed in us. We're looking to see uh, Christ come forth in our lives and in our church and in our fellowship and in our city and our families. And so even though you may be going through some travail, there is the joy. And Christ was able to endure the cross because of the joy that was set before him. And so just want to encourage you all tonight to to look for the joy that is set before you and understand that God is working in the waiting. Amen.